Okay, okay. So um, I'm going to do a talk about this book called Saving Monticello. It's a history of Thomas Jefferson's house, but it focuses on what uh, happened after Jefferson died. And um, it's a long and uh, interesting and uh, little known story of historic preservation as a Jewish American history component to it. It's a story of Thomas Jefferson and architecture. And, um, you know, historic preservation is at the center of this talk and uh, Virginia historic preservation in specific, specifically. And I always like to say that, uh, you know, I'm, I live in Virginia and we Virginians have a special uh, feeling for historic preservation. And the way I like to illustrate it is to ask the question, how many Virginians does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is three, one to change the bulb and two to reminisce about how good the old one was. <laughs> so, this, this story of historic preservation begins on one of the most amazing days in American history. And that was the day that Thomas Jefferson died. And I think you guys probably know what day that was. July 4th, July 4th, 1826, no less, the 50th anniversary of the Republic of which Jefferson was so instrumental in founding. And, you know, he died at about one o'clock in the afternoon up on his farm, up on the mountain up there at Monticello. And then a couple of hours later at his farm in Massachusetts, John Adams died. Our second and third presidents died on the 50th anniversary of the Republic that they, that they formed. And, you know, when word got out and word did get out, you know, this was, I think it was before Twitter and CNN, but I'm not sure, but word did get out. And, uh, you know, people reacted apocalyptically. Uh, John Quincy Adams uh, wrote in his diary, these two men dying on this day was uh, divine intervention. Um, and, you know, the other thing you should know about July 4th, 1826, is that when Thomas Jefferson died, he was over $107,000 in debt. $107,000 in debt in 1826. Well, 107000 people ask me all the time, how much would that be in current dollars? Because that's an awful lot of money, even today. And, you know, there's websites you can go to that you can place in figures and they do estimates. Anyway, the best estimate is that the family faced at least uh, $2 million in debt. And who was the family? So, well, let me just, before we do that, you know, how did, how did, how did he, did Jefferson know what he was doing? What, what happened with all that debt? We'll get into that in a minute. But he knew he was going to pass on debts to his family. So in 1815, um, the year after the end, the end of the, um, I almost said Spanish-American War, of the War of 1812, um, Jefferson sold his entire library to the Congress. You know, there was a, 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 the, the British burned the, the library, treasured White House, remember, after the Battle of Bladensburg. And Jefferson was in need of money, so he sold almost 7,000 books to the country for almost $24,000. And um, if you go to the Library of Congress, it, and it became the foundation uh, of the new library, but became the Library of Congress. And if you go to the Library of Congress today, they have the books the books that he sold, and uh, you know, a lot of them were burned in a fire in the 1850s, and they've replaced nearly all of them. I got to see um, the room where they displayed it when I was doing the research for this book way back in 2000. It's definitely worth seeing if you go to the Library of Congress. Um, there, there's a, a plaintive letter that he wrote to a friend at when the last books were uh, being taken off of Monticello. You know, he, here's a man who said, "I cannot live without books," and of course. You know, book dealers knew that, and this was 1815. So between then and when he died in 1826, they came up there and sold him so many books. He had 3,000 more books when he died that the family uh, had to get rid of to pay his debt. So who did um, inherit? You know, his, his, remember that Jefferson's wife, whose name was Martha, she had died, and his oldest daughter, Martha Randolph, um, lived up there at Monticello with him because she had a kind of a no good husband with her 11 children. And she was the executor of, of his estate. She was a Randolph, uh, he, you know, she came from the Randolph family. She married a Randolph and her son, Thomas Jefferson Randolph, Thomas Jefferson's favorite grandchild inherited the $107,000 debt. They didn't know what to do. They were the Randolphs of Virginia, but they were land rich and cash poor. 
And very reluctantly, they decided first that they would sell off all of Jefferson's stuff, you know, to use the technical term, his furniture and furnishings. And of course, what else did he own? You know, over 200 enslaved people. So they had an auction up on the mountain a year after he died in 1827. We don't know how much totally they got from the auction, um, but we do know that it wasn't enough to uh, cover the debt. And um, here are some documents that, have, uh, that I found about some of the stuff that was sold. And, you know, it gives you a little chilling thing to see uh, people listed there. One Negro boy, $355, two chairs, et cetera, et cetera. Here's another one. One Negro uh, mama, a woman, Rachel, $85. Oh, and a feather bed, $1,750. Um, so, um, they decided, family reluctantly decided that they would have to sell Monticello and the acreage around it, which was, you know, Jefferson inherited over 5,000 acres from his father. Not all, not all around Monticello, but it was, it was well up there. And you know what? They didn't sell it. They weren't able to sell it for about four years. And when we think about it, it's sort of puzzling today because Monticello is an icon. You know, it's uh, listed as a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. And the only residence in the United States, North America, that's listed there. You know what World Heritage Site? We're talking about the Grand Canyon, the Taj Mahal, places like that. Um, you know, it's been on the back of, it was on the back of the $2 bill from 1912 until 1976, when they changed it to that scene of the Declaration of Independence. It's been on postage stamps, you know, you have a nickel in your pocket, you have a picture of Monticello. Um, this is the so-called nickel view of Monticello from the uh, south entrance. Um, and, you know, it is just one gorgeous, I mean, you can't take a bad picture of Monticello. And I have a, I have a few of them here that, that kind of prove that. Oh, you know where it is, people, I'm sure you all have been there up in the Blue Ridge Mountain, right in the foothills of the Blue Ridge. Um, in the spring and the fall, it's just spectacular. You're looking at the nickel view there again. Um, just happened to prove that you can't take a bad picture of Monticello because I took this picture one morning. I was on a special tour facing east um, just at 9.30 in the morning. It was just, that was, that was amateur photographer myself. So, um, Fish pond, another picture of the fish pond. So, you know, I, I'm saying that Monticello is the third most well-known house in the United States, right? We all know what number one is, White House. And of course, you all know what number two is, Graceland, right? Elvis Presley's house. So I'm only half joking when I say that. But so this, this icon of American architecture, what... President Theodore Roosevelt called Thomas Jefferson's essay in architecture. Um, it took, why did it take the Randolphs um, four years to um, sell the place? Well, for one thing, Thomas Jefferson was a self-trained architect and he had some interesting ideas about architecture. He was the first person to put a dome on a, you know, Monticello itself was one of the first architecturally designed residences in the United States. And Jefferson put a dome on it which, you know, was unprecedented. Um, he did not put a, a giant staircase. You know, this is the parlor, uh, the entrance hall, but sorry, the entrance hall, and, you know, where you come in on the tour. Um, and if you look, you don't see any giant staircase. He didn't believe in them. There are two small staircases that wind up upstairs. He also didn't really believe in bedrooms. The, the family's bedrooms are upstairs. There's no, there are nothing, uh, nothing special. He himself didn't even want a bedroom. I think you probably know this. This is his bed chamber. He designed this bed in a little archway between his cabinet, which is like his office and his dressing room here. So, um, plus he put the place up on a mountain. Think about it. I mean, if you've been to Monticello, you know, it's a nice drive up that mountain, maybe a mile up, a, a, it's not a giant mountain, but can you imagine what it was like back then when there were no, when the roads weren't paved and you had to bring water up there and supplies. And so um, most of the other houses of, of that type were built on flat surfaces, you know, for transportation purposes. So for all that, this kind of quirky house, it was like a 
white elephant. The family, you know, there was no MLS back then. It was never listed for sale. But if you read the letters, you know, the price is, you know, there's somebody, one of them says 40,000, 20,000. Anyway, it didn't sell and it didn't sell. And finally it did sell in 1831 uh, to this man, James Turner Barclay. And he bought it from the Randolphs with 552 acres for $7,000. And um, I don't have time to talk too much about uh, James Turner uh, Barclay because, um, you know, our time is limited. But um, Barclay was an eccentric man. He was a pharmacist in Charlottesville. Back then, you had to be an MD to be a pharmacist. So he had a medical degree from what is now the University of Pennsylvania. But um, he decided, among, he moved his family up there and he decided he wanted to um, start a silkworm business up there. And um, he, there was something called the Grove. It was a grove, eight acre grove of trees that Jefferson planted and Barclay all but destroyed it. The, the mulberry bushes that he put in, no, nothing worked up there for him. People kept coming up to see this place, bidden and unbidden. And Barclay decided he didn't want it anymore. So he put, you know, put it on the market. He let it be known that, it, that it, he sold off acreage. It was down to 219 acres and he sold it in 1834. And um, this is not a picture from 1834, this is from later, but the place was a wreck uh, when he sold it. So here's kind of a comparison between what it looked like at its worst, because we're gonna go into another period of decline later, which I'll explain and what it's like today. So uh, someone who was there wrote in a letter back home that all was in dilapidation and ruin. How did Monticello get to be in dilapidation and ruin? Well, a lot of it had to do with Thomas Jefferson's uh, financial condition. Um, you know, he, uh, came, uh, he came back to Monticello in 1809 after serving his two terms as president, but there was no presidential pension back then. And he had over $11,000 in debts going back to the Revolutionary War. And he thought that he could pay off those debts with his farming and business ventures. Well, Think about Thomas Jefferson. Think about this man who was president, vice president, secretary of state, ambassador to France, governor of Virginia. He wrote the Virginia Declaration. Uh, what the, um, the he wrote the you know the Bill of Rights and uh, the religious freedom law in Virginia. Um, he he was an arch archaeologist, astronomist, architect. Um, you name it, he did it. I mean, you remember that great quote from President Kennedy when he had all those Nobel laureates for dinner in the White House, you know. I think that this is the most extraordinary collection of talent, human knowledge ever gathered together at the White House with the possible exception of when Thomas Jefferson dined alone. Well, there was one area of life that Jefferson was not good at, and that was business. You know, he just was not a good businessman for whatever reason. Everything you know, he thought that he could turn these debts into, pay off the debts with his farming and business ventures. But everything failed. You know, when he had 5,000 acres. He had these other farms. When the crops were good, prices were bad. When prices were bad, crops were good. Um, you know, he, uh, he bought natural bridge from the King of England, hoping to turn that into a tourist attraction. It didn't, didn't work. Uh, he just lost money. He had he he owned three mills on the river down there. They just leaked money. Um, he owed money to all the merchants in Charlotte. You know, he had enslaved people doing most of the work, all the work probably, but he didn't and he didn't pay them. But he did have to house house them and clothe them and feed them. He owed money to everybody. He doted on his children and his grandchildren. He like he spent money like crazy. You know, he bought wine by the boatload from France, um, and also visitors kept coming up there. Bidden and unbidden, family, uh, close friends, and they brought, you know, servants and enslaved people. And it wasn't uncommon for 20 or 30 people to be living up there for weeks, if not months at a time. In short, he, the term preventive maintenance wasn't in, in, in the lexicon, but that's what happened. The place just, he just couldn't afford to keep it up. And it didn't get any better under James Turner Barclay. So finally, um, Barclay sells Monticello in 1834 to a most unlikely buyer. And that is a man named Uriah Phillips Levy. Uriah P. Levy, who then was a Lieutenant in the US Navy 
and he purchased Monticello and 219 acres from James Turner Barkley for $2,700. All was in dilapidation and ruin. Levies uh, set about to repair, restore, and preserve Monticello, although the words preserve and repair, <laughs> preserve and restore were not in the language. And um, we have evidence from newspaper articles and letters at the time that he most certainly did that uh, within a couple of years. So um, let's talk a little bit about this remarkable man, Uriah Levy, uh, and then talk about what he did at Monticello and go over his Navy career. So he was born in 1892 in Philadelphia. This is a portrait of him that now stands at, in the US Navy Academy Museum. You know, he was the first uh, Jewish American to have a full Navy career. He served 50 years in the US Navy. And when he retired, he was, a, well, he died in service. When he died in service, he was a Commodore. So he was, a high, he was the highest ranking, first Jew to be a high, first Jewish Commodore, which was the highest rank in the Navy at the time. This is a photograph of him late in life. Um, he was born in 1892 in Philadelphia. He was a fifth generation American. People seem to have a hard time processing that, but his great, great grandfather came over here in 1733 with a group of 12, with a group of 40 Jews who had escaped the Inquisition uh, from Portugal, came to London, and uh, the uh, men, you know, they had to, they, they had to be crypto Jews, right? They couldn't practice their religion in, in Lisbon. Uh, this was, his great-great-grandfather was a, a doctor, a medical doctor named Dr. Samuel Munish, N-U-N-E-Z. And the, the, the family story is that he was the um, physician to the king of Portugal, the court physician, and um, th that they had to be not, they weren't able to practice their religion, that uh, they were Inquisition spies living in the house, and they made this miraculous escape by inviting an English sea captain over for dinner one day, and they said, would you like to see the ship after dinner? And when he did, they sailed off to England, um, which is a great story. I hope it's true, but um, it's come down. They got to London. A couple of years, they met up with other Jews, and they took off on this ship. This is the actual ship. No, it isn't. Wait, it's a model of the William and Sarah, which uh, they arrived in uh, Savannah, Georgia, in uh, June of, eight, of 1733. So the, this group of 40 Jews were among the founders of Savannah, um, I found this record from a 18th century early settlers of Georgia uh, document. And if you can go down the left-hand column, you see N and then number 10. Can you see it? It says Munish, N-U-N-E-Z, Samuel M-D. And occupation, it says Jew. And uh, underneath, you can see um, his family members who came with him. So those group of 40 Jews, uh, oh, by the way, uh, Dr. Munish was the only medical doctor in the entire colony of Georgia for many years, and there was an epidemic, we think it was smallpox, and he helped stem the epidemic, and he was cited by um, Governor Oglethorpe of Georgia, and uh, that, uh, that document that, that he cited um, is in the museum at the synagogue. Did something here? Okay. Mikve Israel. Those, uh, have, have anybody been to Savannah? and they've been to downtown, they must have seen Mikra Israel. It's the third oldest Jewish congregation in the nation, started by those 40 Jews. There's a picture of it. This isn't the old building, but this is their beautiful uh, temple downtown on one of those beautiful uh, squares in downtown Savannah. This is the inside of the sanctuary. It's just a gorgeous place. And a couple of years ago, they invited me down there. Uh, I was scholar in residence. The residence lasted a weekend, but it was my pleasure to do a talk on this book for them um, after services on Saturday morning. Um, one of Uriah Levy's uh, grand, uh, grand, great grandmother and grandfather moved to New York, uh, the Machados, uh, and he was a Hazan of Shirith Israel, which is the oldest Jewish congregation in the nation. This is their fourth building from 18, well, they, they founded in 1654. This is their fourth building in New York uh, from 1860. This is the current building 
which is also a marvelous place. Um, in 1897, Beaux-Arts Building in Central Park West. I, I was lucky enough to do a talk there when the book came out. It was just an amazing experience. Um, this is a sanctuary at Shirith, Israel. So the Levies have ties to the, to the oldest Jewish congregation. Shirith, Israel, the Mikve Israel in um, Savannah. And uh, we'll see in a minute Mikve Israel in Philadelphia because um, Uriah Levy's maternal grandfather, we talk about him because he was important in Uriah Levy's life, Jonas Phillips, came over here from Germany uh, before the Revolutionary War. He was a merchant, he moved to Philadelphia, and he became, uh, 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 he joined the Philadelphia militia unit, and he fought in the revolution against the Brits. Uh, Uriah Levy supposedly was his favorite grandchild, and he uh, brought him up to be a patriotic American. Supposedly, Uriah's two heroes growing up were George Washington and John Paul Jones. And um, they were members of Mikv Israel, the second oldest congregation in Center City, Philadelphia. This is their second building, no pictures of the, of the first one. Um, and uh, we'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about Uriah Levy's life in the Navy. So, um, the family story is that he was 10 years old. He ran away from home to be a cabin boy in a ship, but he made sure that he was home by 13 for his bar mitzvah. It's just a great story, and we're hoping it's true. So I'm just like you to know that. But here's what we do know for sure. That at 19, he was part owner of a merchant ship. And in the following year, when he was 20 years old, he joined the U.S. Navy and began a 50-year career in the Navy. He was assistant sailing master of the Argus, uh, which was the most successful American ship blockading the uh, English Channel during the war. I think it uh, captured 25 ships. When it went to capture the 26th, uh, the, the ship was captured, the captain was killed, and the crew was held prisoner for the balance of the war, um, Uriah, including Uriah Levy. He came home and a hero of the War of 1812 and went on to this 50-year career in the U.S. Navy. And um, he was, uh, can you imagine what it was like to be a Jew in the Navy during that time? Um, you may know that Uriah, and Uriah Levy survived, not only did he survive, but he thrived. He was a very strong-willed man and a very tough-minded and tough guy because he was kicked out of the Navy five times all of those court martials, he was, sorry, let me go back. He was court martialed five times and kicked out of the Navy twice, reinstated by two different U.S. presidents. Kicked out because, you know, somebody would call him a dirty Jew and he'd punch him in the face and he would, he would be the one who would get in trouble. He also killed a man in a duel, a fellow, so, a fellow sailor, called him a damn Jew uh, at, a, at a ball in, in Philadelphia. They... they he challenged him to a duel and uh, Levy shot him to death. He was tried for that in, in civilian case and acquitted. So did, you did not mess with Uriah Levy. He was a tough minded, tough man. You know, there's a biography called the, uh, I'll think of the name of it in a minute, but the, the something or other Commodore, uh, the pugnacious Commodore. So this pugnacious man has, his Navy history has been well rewarded. The first Jewish chapel at any Navy base at Norfolk was named after him. It's, a, it's still there in this building. A, a destroyer escort was named after him in World War II, USS Uriah P. Levy. It even had a role in taking the surrender of the Japanese, not at Tokyo Bay, but in one of the um, islands. Um, you know, the, Navy, the Naval Academy never had a Jewish chapel until a couple of years ago, uh, and um, it was built, and what's the name of it? The Commodore Uriah P. Le Levy Center and Chapel. And here's the, another picture of it. The architect who designed it put a dome on one of the entrance, on the, on the entrance toward the river. This is right in the middle of the U.S. Naval Academy, uh, in honor of Uriah Levy's uh, saving of Monticello. And the chapel, the Jewish chapel, is kind of in, uh, designed in the form of a ship to honor Levy's service. 
Yeah, there as a there's also a statue of him outside Mikvah Israel, where the family worshipped in Philadelphia. Uh, there's another picture of it. It was dedicated in 2011, I think. That's the plaque. I helped write that plaque, by the way. I was honored to be asked to do so. I was at the dedication ceremony. It was a, it was a great affair. So the question is, why did this U.S. Navy lieutenant buy Monticello? And the answer is, we don't know 100% certain, but we have some pretty good educated guesses because Levy, all of his Navy records, you know how the Navy is. They, they had a record every time he got on a ship and got off. But his, if he kept a journal, it, it, and no one has ever found it. His letters mention mostly business stuff. But in the few letters that we have, and in the historical evidence that we've uncovered, we strongly believe that Uriah Levy was an ardent admirer of Thomas Jefferson, and when he found out the place was for sale, that he purchased it. Why, why do we know this? Well, on his own, in 1833, when he was in Paris, France, he went up to the top French sculptor of the day, a man named David Danger, and he commissioned out of his own pocket this full-length statue of Thomas Jefferson. He had it shipped to the United States. This is a plaster model of it, painted black, which, which he donated to the city of New York as a current picture of the statue in city council chamber in New York City. Uriah Levy lived in New York City, by the way, when he wasn't on a ship. He donated the statue itself to the people of the United States. Congress didn't quite know what to do with it, so they stuck it or they put it outside the White House. So here's an 1848 lithograph. Can you see that statue in front of the White House? But we do have some photographs from the 1860s. And uh, there it is. Now, it stayed out there um, until the 1880s when it got torn. I, I love these old photographs, so pardon me for showing them off a little bit. I like this view. This is from behind the statue facing out on Lafayette Square. Um, but the statue, uh, you know, it, it was a bronze, so it, it got weathered pretty badly. So Congress took it back, put it in the basement of the, of the Capitol building, and then um, it wasn't until much later that they dusted it off, cleaned it up, and they put it in Statuary Hall. Then it was moved to the Rotunda. Well, here's Statuary Hall, and here's the Rotunda. So if, if you come in the Rotunda, you can see the two statues by that entrance. The one on the left is, is the Jefferson statue by Don Jay. And um, if you take a look at it, uh, you'll see a plaque. It says, donated to the people of the United States by U.S. Navy Lieutenant Uriah Phillips Levy. It's the only public, privately donated statue in the Capitol. So Uriah Levy, by the way, made a small fortune when he was in the Navy. He invested in real estate uh, in the early 1800, uh, well, in the 1820s, uh, in a section of New York City that was a farming village. And um, he bought 11 rooming houses there, something like that. But, and then a few years later, people started moving in artisans to what they call Greenwich Village. And he made a small fortune in real estate, so he was able to buy Monticello. Um, he, he bought the place in 1834 from James Turner Barclay. He didn't take possession until 1836 because there was a lawsuit about what conveyed. They agreed and he took over. He brought his elderly mother to live there and she is buried at Monticello, Rachel Phillips Levy. This is the grave of Rachel Levy. Um, it's an older picture. It's been changed a little bit. You can see the vegetable garden, the thousand foot vegetable garden over to the east of the grave. That's Mulberry Row to the left. This is a current picture of Rachel Levy's grave. He was at sea by the time. That's why she was buried on the grounds because they didn't know what to do, but they knew the Jewish tradition, so they, they put her in the ground right away. So Uriah Levy died um, in 1862 in service. By the way, um, he wanted to fight in the Civil War, um, but um, he was, you know, getting up in years. So, you know, you know what position President Lincoln gave him? He was in charge of the Navy Court Martial Board. They figured he probably knew a lot about it, you know, having five court martials. So, and this is his gravestone at Beth Olin Cemetery in Queens, New York. Um, just going back a tiny bit, because um, Uriah Levy was a northerner, um, Monticello was seized by the Confederate government. 
because it was owned by a northerner. He hired a lawyer when they tried to get it. And after he died, they kept the lawsuit going, but they finally lost. And in 1864, the Confederate States of America took over Monticello. They had an auction and they auctioned off um, the property and um, Uriah Levy's possessions, including slave people. And this was an article from the New York Times. You don't have to read it, but it just, you know, it's sort of chilling to, to read how much people by name sold for. Um, uh, and we'll talk about Uriah Levy's brother Jonas in a minute because he tried to get Monticello, but um, it was sold to this man, Ben Ficklin, who was a Confederate colonel. And uh, he moved his family up there in November of 64, but then the war ended in March of 65 and um, they left. People ask me sometimes, you know, did Monticello get damaged during the Civil War? Luckily, even though 60% of the war was fought in Virginia, there was no, no battles in Charlottesville. A little skirmishing here or there, nothing bad. However, it was a crossroads for Union and Confederate troops and they came up there like other people did. And, you know, uh, they, they didn't do any damage, but they did cause some wear and tear. Now, just a little bit about Uriah Levy's will. You know, um, he, he married late in life. He didn't have any children. And uh, he left, well, we don't quite know exactly why he did this, but he left Monticello to the people of the United States to be used as an, as an agricultural school for the orphans of Navy warrant officers. Think about that one for a minute. The orphans, we don't even know if there were any orphans of Navy warrant officers. Um, in 1862. Well, the, the family, now even though he had uh, no children, he had a wife and he had, what, 12 brothers and sisters. There were 64 other people named in the will. They challenged the will in court. And so the lawsuits, they were called partition lawsuits, and they went on for 17 years. They wound up in the Supreme Courts of both Virginia and New York. And in the meantime, while the family was fighting it out, the government, by the way, had said no. So the family was trying to figure out what to do about it. And um, the place went into ruin again. And this is the oldest known photo of Monticello, taken about 1870. And you can see with your own eyes, the windows are broken. The, you can't see the roof caving in. The grounds were in terrible condition. The terraces had rotted away. And just very quickly, the main reason that happened was that on, during those 17 years, it, Monticello was under the care of a caretaker who didn't take very good care of it. His name was Joel Wheeler. And uh, I'll just tell you quickly three things that Joel Wheeler did that weren't in Monticello's best interest. Number one, he housed cattle in the basement during the winter. Number two, he stored and milled grain on those beautiful parquet floors in the parlor. And number three, and worst of all, he allowed University of Virginia students to have parties there. So I don't have to explain that to any audience who um, lives around here. Those UVA students wrecked the place. So did other people. I mean, he also allowed others. So the point being that the place was in dilapidation and ruin when the lawsuit was set. set well, here's a picture of Thomas Jefferson's grave. There was this uh, tradition that they called chipping. People would come and take chips out of the grave. They took chips out of the plaster inside the house. There was a tradition of signing your name in the dome room. There were 3,000 signatures scrawled in the ceiling of the dome room in the house. The lawsuits were settled in 1879 when Uriah Levy's nephew, this man, and his name was Jefferson Monroe Levy, it was named after two presidents. His father was Jonas Levy, who I showed you before, Uriah Levy's brother. Uh, he was a, a, a lawyer and a three-term member of Congress, and also a very successful real estate and stock speculator, also from New York City. And Jefferson Levy bought out the other heirs for $10,500, kicked out Joel Wheeler, brought in his own superintendent, and once again, a second member of the Levy family repaired, restored, and preserved Monticello. And we'll just talk about Jefferson Levy very briefly, because uh, he was a very interesting man. Um, I have some photos of him. This is him a little bit later in life. This is him on Capitol Hill when he was a member of Congress, three terms in the early 20th century. A picture of Jefferson Monroe Levy. By the way, his father, Jonas, also named one of his other sons 
L. Nap Louis Napoleon Levy. He was an interesting man. Um, so we have photographic evidence. These are family photos that descendants kindly let me uh, have for the book. And you can see here, we're talking about 1905, something like that, that um, the windows are, every, everything is looking good. There's some more photos taken later. Here's the lithograph um, that shows the place in great condition, but these are photographs. And the thing that architectural historians uh, are, preservationists are so pleased with both of the levees is that they never did anything bad at Monticello. They never added on to it. They never took anything away. All Jefferson Levy did was he modernized the heating and the plumbing. And if you see those, you see those two lions statues, that's all he did. He, oh, he put dormers on, but that was it. And, the, and there were four what they called Levy lions. Um, there's another picture. See the lions? They're pretty hideous. They're, they're not there anymore. Um, I love that picture. There were two on the grounds coming up and two and, uh, on the north entrance. Um, and he put some statuary around. Now, Jefferson Levy uh, was a very sociable man. He was a lifelong bachelor. Um, he, he moved, he lived in New York City, but he also uh, spent a significant amount of time at Monticello. Uh, his sister, Amelia, was his hostess there, and they were always having visitors there, members of Congress, ambassadors, the Bridge Club from Richmond, the DAR chapter from Charlottesville. And he was a very social man. Um, he had two presidents visit. Grover Cleveland came in 1888 and uh, when he was in Charlottesville. And President Theodore Roosevelt came in 1902. And being Theodore Roosevelt, he decided he wanted to ride a horse up to the mountain when he was visiting in Charlottesville. And they accommodated him and he came up. Okay, so what is that expression? No good deed goes unpunished. In uh, 1911, a national movement grew up to take Monticello from Jefferson Levy and turn it into a government-run shrine to Thomas Jefferson. It was led by this man, this woman on the right, Maud Littleton, known as Mrs. Littleton. And by the way, in, in the press, by the way, Jefferson Levy and Uriah Levy purchased more acreage. So Monticello was up to about 600 acres. Now, um, the, and Jefferson Levy, who bought the place with no furniture, said that he was going to try to reacquire all that furniture and furnishings that was sold back in 1827. He wasn't successful. He only got a few things, a uh, rug, a lamp, a table here or there. But he did fill that whole place with um, uh, antiques, period pieces, that um, he was going to convey all of that. Um, well, we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, Mrs. Littleton, uh, I'll go to the Mrs. Littleton story. I got a little ahead of myself here because I'm rushing a little bit, Sheldon, because I know I'm going over my time here. Um, so let's talk about Mrs. Littleton and her campaign. Her husband was a man named Martin Wiley Littleton, a big lawyer and a member of Congress from New York, Long Island. And um, they were friends with Jefferson Levy. They were visiting Charlottesville in 1809, 1909, sorry. And um, they were visiting the university uh, president, Alderman, and Jefferson Levy was at Monticello, heard they were in town, invited him up for lunch. And later, Mrs. Littleton said she was appalled by what she saw there. She said that Jefferson Levy was turning the place into a shrine to Uriah Levy. This should not stand. It should be open to the public. And she started a national campaign to take Monticello from Jefferson Levy. Um, it uh, made the newspapers. Um, there was a bill introduced in Congress uh, at her behest in the summer of 1912. There were hearings on Capitol Hill that were bombastic. Uh, Jefferson Levy, not a shy and retiring man, he once said, you know, I'll sell Monticello when the White House is for sale. He wanted to keep that place. So he argued it out. He, he hired a lawyer named Tom Duke, Judge Duke from Charlottesville, whose grandfather was Thomas Jefferson's lawyer. And Jefferson Levy and his lawyer battled it out with Mrs. Littleton and her forces for who would control this house. And um, these hearings were bombastic. They made headlines in all the newspapers. Some people called it the War of 1912. Well, the War of 1912 ended in December when... Um, the bill came up for a vote on, Cap on Capitol Hill. 
to, to condemn Monticello and turn it into a government run house museum. It was defeated. It was defeated on what we would call property managed, you know, uh, property rights argument. You know, the government had never taken a piece of property from a private person, much less trying to turn it into a, uh, a shrine. So Jefferson Levy declared victory, but Mrs. Littleton did not give in. They had to, she had the bill reintroduced. There were more hearings in 1913, even into 1914. Uh, by the way, so this is a, this is a, that, remember that portrait that I showed you earlier? This is when it was hanging in Monticello. When, and, and indeed, there was this portrait in there, and there was a model of uh, Uriah Levy's ships, but, but Jefferson Levy was by no means turning it into a shrine to uh, his uncle. She had petitions signed by hundreds of thousands of people. She, had, she was a wealthy woman. She had time. She had motivation. She had the energy. Um, Finally, in October of 1914, Jefferson Levy gave in. You know, the guy who said he would never sell it said that, okay, supposedly because President Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, got on the team and he was a Democrat and Levy was a Democrat. But anyway, we think that he probably just needed the money. And so he, he said that he would sell the place um, for 500000 And um, remember, he bought it for 10000 but he'd owned it all these years and he said that he had spent, you know, more than, well, more than a million, probably a million and a half, running that place as a farm, repairing it, restoring it, preserving it. And so Congress had more hearings for the next three years, but they could never wrap their arms around that $500,000 figure. Um, so um, I just have to tell you very quickly that, um, Mrs. Littleton's campaign to take Monticello from Jefferson Levy was tinged with anti-Semitism. Neither Mrs. Littleton nor of course ever came right out and said, Jews shouldn't own this place, but in her literature, in her speeches, and in her followers, they, you know, she had magazine articles written. They used, uh, you know, what, what do we call them now, dog whistles. They used, um, they called the, the Levy's aliens and outsiders as if, Jefferson Levy couldn't have been more inside, you know. By this time, he was a sixth generation American. So, um, and there was also a horrible story that, um, that they made up that made the newspapers and magazines about how Uriah Levy supposedly purchased Monticello, that he was in a coach coming down to Charlottesville and just happened to be sitting next to him was a man who told him he was going to buy Monticello and give it to the Randolphs. So in this story, Uriah Levy gets him drunk and he buys Monticello out from under him. And worst of all, the dialogue that's made up, they have Uriah Levy speaking in this shy, locky Yiddish accent, you know, for the man who was born in Philadelphia and was a, was a U.S. Navy officer. So I'm sorry to say it, it wasn't a good thing, but um, it, 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 has to be, it has to be mentioned. So um, when World War I broke out in 1917, Congress dropped the matter. Um, Mrs. Littleton had stepped away when Levy said that he was going to, and then Levy announced in 1918 that he would sell the place. So, uh, well, he announced it earlier, but he really stepped it up. He, he, um, he got a, um, a, a realtor named Hillary in Washington, D.C., who specialized in Virginia states. I found a few le prospecting letters and advertisements that Hillary made up. Um, that he wanted to sell Monticello. Um, and um, it didn't sell until 1921 uh, when the Thomas Jefferson Foundation was formed specifically to purchase Monticello. It was found, it formed in New York. There were a few Virginians on the, uh, in the group and um, they met, they were mostly um, lawyers and, uh, you know, business tycoons and they, took out uh, a mortgage and they purchased Monticello. And um, the first thing that they did after they, well, uh, the first thing that they did after they um, bought it was they um, had an auction up there and they auctioned off all of the stuff that Jefferson Levy um, had, uh, had filled that house with. Um, and you know, Monticello today, that they has is filled with 
about a third, they have reacquired about a third of, um, of what you see inside the house. About a third they bought are, are period pieces and there are some, um, you know, current pieces of furniture and furnishings in there. Just a couple of pictures of Monticello. I just wanted to end um, by reading to you uh, about um, the day that, Tom, that, that Jefferson Levy and turned over the, sold the place in, in, 19, in 1921. This was up in New York City. Sorry, did I say 1920? It was 1923. Um, a man who was there said the cash and the bonds and mortgage were delivered to Levy and Levy signed the deed conveying full title to the property and all belongings to the foundation. This was a very emotional scene and he burst out crying. He said that he never dreamt that he would ever part with the property. And then three months later, on March 6, 1924, at his home on East 37th Street in New York City, Jefferson Levy died of heart disease five weeks short of his 72nd birthday. And let me just finish by uh, telling you that um, Jefferson Levy, not a shy and retiring man, liked to compare himself to Thomas Jefferson. You know, he was named after Jefferson. He was a tall man. He was like 6'3", like Jefferson was. He, uh, he once gave a dinner at Monticello uh, for a bunch of guests where all seven courses were uh, from Thomas Jefferson's recipe books. And then every 4th of July, he made it a point to be at Monticello and we'd have an Independence Day party. He would invite people from Charlottesville up to the mountaintop. They would have a picnic, they would have fireworks, and he would end the evening by coming out on the lawn and reading the Declaration of Independence from Thomas Jefferson's music stand. And the last thing I'll say, and the last way that Thomas Jefferson emulated, sorry, the last way that Jefferson Levy emulated Thomas Jefferson was that when Jefferson Levy died, he was over two million dollars in debt. That's my story, so thank you very much. There's a fourth of July, okay. I do have a newsletter that I have that um, I've been doing it for, gosh, I don't know, 17, 18 years. I put one out every month. I, might, I find uh, information about Levy's and Monticello. If you're interested, email me. It's my name at Gmail or go to my website. So.